So good afternoon, everybody. We will talk about why, what are clinical trials, why are they important, and why you should consider participating in them. Uh, I work at University of Michigan. My name is Dinesh Khanna, and you know I direct the scleroderma program in Ann Arbor. So here's the overview that we will be talking about. So we'll talk about what are clinical trials, why do people participate in clinical trials, what is clinical research, who participates in them, what do I need to know if I'm thinking about it, what questions should you ask if an investigator or a coordinator approaches you, what happens after a clinical trial is over, and how does the outcome of clinical research makes a difference. So we'll carefully go over these and we will open it up, but we are recording this, so if you have a question, uh, we have a mic that will be rotated and you please ask that question in there. So clinical trials are part of any research that we do. And to start the talk, the advances in the management of diabetes, the advances in management of hypertension, cancers, never would have been made unless and until we would have done clinical trials. So clinical trials is the heart of all the medical advances and all the research that we do. Uh, trials are a way to find new ways to prevent, detect, or treat diseases and that could be new diseases or a new drugs such as mycophenolate or perfenidone for lung fibrosis. It can be a combination of drugs. It could be new surgical procedures. It can be new ways to use existing treatment. Different ways, different formulations that you can think about. And the goal of different clinical trial aspects that I will go about is whether the clinical procedure or intervention is safe whether it's effective, and whether it's better than doing nothing. Because a lot of time when you take a drug, it may be as good as taking a placebo pill. So we are trying to differentiate that in those clinical trials. Now people feel very strongly to participate in trials is to help others. Scleroderma is a rare disease. We don't know what really causes scleroderma, although we are trying to understand and we are starting to understand that. There is a small genetic component. So people feel that I must participate in a clinical trial to help others. There are healthy volunteers who want to move the science forward. And those with disease may want to receive the newest treatment and have additional care of the illness. And I want to highlight the point. People who participate in clinical trials of scleroderma tend to do better on average compared to people who do not participate in clinical trial. And the reason being, it's not that the treatments largely have been effective. Most of the clinical trials that we have done have, have been negative. But because you are coming to a center on regular basis, we do catch things much early and start to treat that early compared to if you were seeing a doctor every four to six months. So people tend, tend to do much better when they come into clinical trials. I want to spend about five minutes talking about clinical research and how does the idea come, and I'll show you some of the examples. So clinical research is medical research that involves people like you and me. And it is carefully conducted, finding better ways to treat, prevent, diagnose, or understand human disease. It could be new trials. It could be a study, an observational study, where we do skin biopsies or take blood from you and try to find out that why did a person did very well with diffuse scleroderma and why did somebody develop lung fibrosis and why did somebody require stem cell transplantation. When people walk into the clinic, they all look the same. Not literally, but they have diffuse disease. So let's say they have diffuse disease and I've examined the pe people, but people have such variable courses. It's very hard for me to tell in the first visit how a person will do long term. But these blood tests, these skin biopsies, give us a 
a window into what may be able to determine in the future. So, you know, that's how the clinical trials and clinical research can help. The idea for a clinical trial often starts in a lab. The mice, our friends, uh, those really help us think about what is the idea, what we can tinker with in, in, a, in a mouse or in a clinical research setting in the lab and trying to move the field forward. Uh, during a trial, we talk about the experiment and I'll talk about the risk and the effectiveness. So every clinical research should have a protocol and must have a protocol. So if you come to University of Michigan and you visit me, if I approach you or one of our staff approaches you for clinical trial, they should have a protocol and an informed consent. And I assume most of you have seen that informed consent. But the protocol is written to carefully make sure that the participation and the participants are safe. So one take home message from this talk is that clinical research and clinical trial goes through different ethical boards. And the goal of all the boards is one, to keep the safety of the person as a, at the top of it. A, B, all the clinical research we do is voluntary. In other words, nobody can tell you and should not tell you that if you, party, if you sign, this is the agreement for lifelong, your house is under my name. There's, there's nothing like this that's happening. Um, it is voluntary, and if you want to stop participating in the trial a week later, a month later, or two years later, you should be allowed to do that and should not impact the treatment from that physician. A clinical study is usually led by a principal investigator. I am leading a very large 25-center study of a drug called Orencia. Uh, which is already approved for rheumatoid arthritis, and that's where the idea came in our lab. That's where we got the funding, and that's what we are testing, and we will find out the results next year, whether a drug for rheumatoid arthritis is effective in patients who have early diffuse scleroderma. I talked about the IRB. IRB is the Institutional Review Board, and it's an independent committee of doctors, statisticians, and member of ethic ethic and community, and again, they have one goal, to ensure that it makes sense. The risks are minimal, and to make sure that the benefits outweigh the risk. So if somebody wants to do radiation for scleroderma, hypothetically, it makes sense. You give a lot of radiation, and you kill the bad immune cells. But if 30% of the people are going to die, that's not a good idea. So the effectiveness has to far exceed than the harm caused by the, by the procedure or the drug. So who sponsors these clinical trials? Sponsors are usually foundations, Scleroderma Foundation, Scleroderma Research Foundation, Arthritis Foundation, medical institutions, but largely pharmaceutical companies, and some of them are represented here, and largely NIH, National Institutes of Health or Department of Veteran Affairs. So these are the large federal institutions that usually fund clinical trials or pharmaceutical companies. So every time you enter or go for a clinical trial, you should have an informed consent. And there's a process that we must follow and everybody should follow about the informed consent. And that should talk about the purpose, the duration, what is expected of you, what are the risk and potential benefits. And again, informed consent is not a contract. I think that's a, probably a really important aspect from this lecture. So here are different clinical studies that we do, including clinical trials. I want to know how people with scleroderma do over the next 10 years. I will be collecting skin I biopsy, I'll be collecting blood, I'll be collecting your lung function test, I'll be looking at your skin score, I'll be looking at your quality of life. I am not giving you any intervention. That's all I'm doing. I want to prevent pulmonary hypertension in you. So I screen, I know who are the people who are at risk of developing pulmonary hypertension. 
What, what can I do? I can select those people and try to prevent. That's an intervention. I can give as an example, people who are at high risk of pulmonary hypertension Viagra and half the people nothing. And I can see whether Viagra, which is approved for pulmonary hypertension or sildenafil, can prevent pulmonary hypertension. I want to screen pulmonary hypertension much better than what we do right now. Why? Because I know pulmonary hypertension is the leading cause of death or one of the leading causes of death in scleroderma. So how do I screen it better? And I'm just giving examples how clinicians and how scientists think about this. Diagnosis. How can I diagnose pulmonary hypertension by a blood test or how can I diagnose scleroderma much earlier at a primary care level and the patients don't have to come to a scleroderma doctor to make that diagnosis. Treatment trials will talk about, and I think the quality of life, which is paramount and important, especially when we don't have a lot of treatments for chronic disease, uh, how do you design that? Anytime you do a clinical trial or you think about a process of a clinical trial, the drug development starts in a lab. Somebody finds that Sildenafil, and I'll take the example of Viagra. Sildenafil causes dilatation of blood vessels. Okay? They found that nitric oxide, NO, which is an enzyme, if you inhibit that, there's a dilatation of blood vessels. Somebody tested that in the mice. Pfizer or somebody developed a drug. Now that drug comes into phase one trials. So phase one are healthy volunteers, college graduates, college students, uh, other healthy volunteers, where it's being tested for the first time to look at the safety of the drug. Tylenol, Viagra, Motrin, every drug that goes through FDA approval goes through these different phases. Of every 10,000 compounds that are Interesting in mice, two or three make it to approval. So every 10,000 compounds there are, two to three make it to the approval process. Once a drug is deemed to be safe, then it comes into phase two trials. And there are a lot of phase two trials going on in scleroderma right now. There's a Orencia trial I talked about. There's a drug called Rio Ciguat or Adempas and other trials that are going on. This is usually done in people who have the disease. 100 to 300 people, and you try to find what's an optimal dose and how is the drug safe or unsafe in people. Then you come to phase three trials. Phase three trials are called pivotal trials based on which the FDA gives approval. So Viagra or sildenafil was tested in phase one trials and it showed that it's very safe. It has some side effects such as headaches or it can lower your blood pressure. And this may be an appropriate dose. Phase two trials were done in pulmonary arterial hypertension that showed that it improves the six minute walk test and it improves the finding on the right heart cath. Then they did a phase three trial and you usually have to do two phase three trials for the FDA to say that one study was not a fluke. You need two studies to show that you can replicate your results. It's like a mathematics exam, right? You can maybe pass one mathematics, but you have to be smart to pass both the exams. And then after the drug is approved, sometimes you have to do phase four trials. So FDA says, yes, it's good. You have clearly shown that you are effective in pulmonary arterial hypertension, but we are not sure whether you have done enough safety. We want to know more about safety of a drug. We want you to follow these patients over time in real life and see how people do. There are multiple medications, Viax, for example, some of you took it, that was approved, but in phase four was found to be causing a lot of cardiac vascular injury heart attacks and stroke, and it was taken away from the market. So that's why the phase four trials are very important. But every drug that you are taking right now, I'm not talking about the herbals, pills, I'm not talking about over the counter, every FDA approved drug has gone through this process or should have gone through this process. So when we do clinical trials, we compare new products and therapies with existing. People are assigned to receive a placebo. 
Does anybody know what a placebo is? Can somebody? So what do you think a placebo is? It's a sugar pill. It's a sugar pill. So it's a medication that looks exactly like the real medication, but the real compound is not there. Every medication is bound by a filler. You have the active medication, but something has to bind the medication to make it into a capsule. And that's, you know, that filler minus the real medication is a placebo. People should tell you whether placebo is being used in a clinical trial. Now, would you do a clinical trial if you knew there was a placebo? A question that is asked all the time to me is that why should we participate in a placebo controlled trial? I want to get the real drug, right? That's a human nature. I want to know why should I participate in a placebo controlled trial? Well, people participate in a placebo controlled trial. A, that is how the approval of the drug process goes. You have to show that the impact of the mind, every person, majority of the person, I should say, who come in scleroderma clinical trials improve. Now, it could be selection bias that people who decide to participate in scleroderma clinical trials are healthier. Sick people are not offered clinical trials. People who live far off do not want to do clinical trial. There are ethnic bias. 90% of all the clinical trials are represented by Caucasians. Any clinical trial you look at scleroderma, 90% of the people who participate are Caucasians. But most of the people who come in clinical trials do much better in clinical trials than if you look at the natural history of cohort of everybody who has scleroderma. I always wondered why. There are different theories. A, when you take a placebo, there are real biological changes that happen. It's not just in your mind. Mind is very powerful. People actually have shown if you take placebo, you have improvement in your blood counts. You have improvement in your MRI findings. You have improvement and softening of your skin. I'm not saying start taking placebo. Uh, when you go out, but it really does have an impact on the disease process. So the rationale of a placebo controlled trial is to differentiate whether the drug, experimental drug, is more effective and safe, and you have to compare it to the placebo. We talked about the placebo controlled trial and every time there's a placebo controlled trial or two effective drugs that are being compared, there's randomization. So the randomization is a process where two or more treatments are assigned randomly. So if you are being assigned to, we were talking about pulmonary hypertension, whether you get sildenafil and somebody gets placebo, it could be a flip of a coin. Every time it's had, you get Sildenafil, it's tail, you get placebo. That's the easiest example to do that. Why do we do that? If you come to me and say that I will only do the trial if you give me the active agent. Well, everybody wants that, so you have a selection bias. I'm giving you that drug because you said I will only do it if you do it. So I'm already collecting a bias, uh, telling, giving it to people who would like to have it. By doing the randomization, I'm taking that bias away, or I'm trying to take that bias away and trying to distribute the group similarly. Because if people are different at the start of the study, it's very hard to interpret the results at the end of the study, because people who were recruited in the studies are different till the end. When one treatment is found to be superior, so as an example, if you're participating in a placebo-controlled trial, there are analyses that might be done, and if there's a clear difference that sildenafil is superior to, to placebo, the drug may be stopped and be available to other people. The placebo-controlled trials are usually single-blinded or double-blinded. Majority of the studies we do are double-blinded. So participants do not know which medication you are on, 
And as an investigator, I don't know what medication you are on. So let's take some examples. Sildenafil. I told you sildenafil side effect is headache, maybe nausea, maybe lowering blood pressure. People who take sildenafil, and if I told you you were taking sildenafil and you felt dizzy, you would say, well, this is a medication that's causing it. In clinical trials of pulmonary hypertension, patients who are on placebo tend to also have a much higher rate of side effects of headache, dizziness, uh, other hypotension compared to if they were not taking, because people feel that they were taking that medication. So you're trying to prevent that. Single-blinded, a patient or a doctor not being told, double-blinded, where you and I both are blinded to what treatment you got. So the only person who may know it, the pharmacist who is putting together the medication and giving it to you. Now, having said that, we started the talk by saying clinical trials are voluntary. So if things are not working well and there are side effects and I need to know, I can unblind you. I can find out what were you taking if that will impact how I need to treat you if you're getting a side effect from a medication. So we talked about healthy volunteers, we talked about phase one trials and who participates in that trial. And then it comes to the patient volunteers, people you know, like you who are trying to find a treatment for themselves. You're trying to find how can I take care of my scleroderma right now. Some of you also want to help improve the knowledge and it may or may not provide a direct benefit to you. Every trial has an inclusion exclusion criteria. So when you walk into the clinic and I want to look at sildenafil for pulmonary arterial hypertension in scleroderma, so the inclusion criteria should be that you have scleroderma. Second should be you have pulmonary arterial hypertension. Exclusion could be that you already have so low blood pressure that if I give you the medication, I put you at risk of fainting. So I need to make sure, safeguard, right? Safeguards of who are coming into the study and who is not coming into the study. On the other hand, if I'm doing a study in early diffuse scleroderma with mycophenolate or CELSEP, I want to make sure you have early disease, you have diffuse disease. Because treating late scleroderma is probably not a good idea. I will not be able to remodel or change the damage that has already been done. I'm giving you toxicity of the drug without giving you any benefit. So every time you come, although the doctors talk about we are doing a clinical trial and you're ready to participate in a clinical trial, if you remember, you go through blood work, you may go through lung function tests, CAT scan and other studies to make sure that it's safe to do it, you are eligible and it meets the benefits would outweigh the risk if you participate in the trial. So we talked about the risk and benefit and it should clearly be stated what are the risks of a medication and what are the benefits of a medication. So it goes through investigator, he has to deem that the benefits outweigh the risk. Well, you could say that I am biased because I believe that sildenafil really works in pulmonary hypertension. Then it goes to an ethics committee. Ethics committee are independent doctors, scientists, community people that say, they look at all the data and say, yes, we agree with Dr. Khanna that the benefits outweigh the risk. Then it comes to you then you have to make the decision after reading the consent form that the benefits outweigh the risk to you. Some people might say, for example, stem cell transplantation is a great example. There's about a three to 5% chance of dying within the first 60 to 90 days after getting stem cell transplantation. Some people want to take that chance. They want to take that risk for the benefit. Many don't want to do that. So at the end of the day, we provide all the information and then you are given the opportunity to make a decision. So what are the potential benefits of participating in a clinical trial? 
I think you play an active role, you provide back to the community, but what I have seen people like doing clinical trials is you are seen so often at a specialized center that things, if they are going wrong, are caught much early. So I can give you an example where a person developed high blood pressure and she was seen every week and she's just developed scleroderma renal crisis, and you all know what scleroderma renal crisis is, and, and we caught it as soon as it started. If I was not seeing her, there's a possibility that if I was seeing her every three to four months, nobody would have ever detected it. And then people like to come and, and you know, feel that they're contributing to the medical research. What are the risks? Some of these drugs have really not been tested in in patients except for healthy volunteers. So you can do many studies in mice, in rabbits, in monkeys, but you know, we are different. So sometimes these drugs, how they will react with you is sometimes difficult to tell. Again, everything goes through ethics, but sometimes there might be unexpected side effects, rare side effects that we have not been able to look at or know about it. The study requires more time and attention. So we want to have you come every two weeks to University of Michigan Sclerodama Center. Well, you live in Nebraska. Uh, is there a center close by? No. Are you willing to come every two weeks from Nebraska? Some people, believe it or not, do it. They come every two weeks to Michigan. But majority of them say, you are crazy. I'm not doing that. But the time and the attention that is required from you to come, you know, that is critical. More blood tests, more CAT scans, for example, for lung fibrosis. You had a CAT scan, but we want to see how CAT scan changes. So we are causing more CAT scans. Again, ethically, it's okay to do that. You, you require more hospital stays, EKG, complex dosing regimens, Sildenafil, we start you on Sildenafil, we tell you to take it three times a day, you are getting dizzy, we decrease it to twice, it's not effective, so we are trying to change and manage dosing and trying to capture every side effect you are having, so it can be burdensome for people. So these are the questions that I came up with when I think about why am I doing this study? What's the purpose of the study? Do I want to find how to prevent pulmonary arterial hypertension? Do I want to find how to treat pulmonary hypertension? Do I want to find how to screen early pulmonary arterial hypertension? Why do I think this approach may be effective? If I say every scleroderma patient here should get a right heart cath, well, I will be pretty darn confident whether you have pulmonary arterial hypertension or not. But is that the right thing to do for every person with scleroderma? Probably not. Probably not. So why do we think the approach we are doing with echocardiograms and blood tests may be effective in screening you early? Who will fund the study? You have to ask the conflict of interest. Doctors work with pharmaceutical companies. Doctors have conflict of interest. You should ask that question. Do you have conflict of interest? What kind of conflict do you have with the, with the pharmaceutical company? Who is funding the study? Is it the federal government that's funding the study? Who has reviewed and approved the study? Now, this is not that an issue in this country. Everything goes through an ethical IRB. If you're coming to University of Michigan, NIH, or University of Michigan IRB, and others have reviewed it. The safety of the participants, you know, that should be part of the consent form. How long does the study last? Think about if you live in Nebraska and I ask you to come every two weeks for the next two years. Are you willing to go through this? You think it's a great idea, you want to do it, but it's better to find a center close to the home to do it. And what will be my responsibilities if I participate? You need to ask this question. Most of the people say, yes, I want to do a clinical trial. I understand these are the risks and benefits. I ask my patients to talk back to me after I've done consenting. We never consent the people the same day we give them the consent form. 
I give them three, four days to think about it, talk to the family, I call them, I chat with them. But you have to know what your responsibilities are. You work eight to five. Well, we want you to be there every two weeks on Monday. That means you have to take time off every other Monday from work. Can you do that? What, what are your responsibilities? So you should be clear about that. And what are the benefits we talked about, the risk of the study? And there are a lot more details here that I will not talk about, uh, like you know the testing. And one question that comes again and again and is important is, will I be reimbursed? In other words, if I'm coming from 400 miles, do I have to use my gas money or there is reimbursement of it? Eh? Two, are all the medical tests and procedures covered by the study or is my insurance liable? Three, if I get an injury during the study. I'm in the hospital, I'm walking, I'm participating in the study and I fall and I, I have a bruise on my head. Who's responsible for that injury? Would the study, or you get a pneumonia participating in the study and we think it's because of the drug you are taking. Will your insurance cover it? Will the study cover it? All these are important questions and should be clearly defined in the consent form. And we talked about the health insurance. So what are the tips that I tell people and I never have them sign the consent form? The first day is to take a family member or a friend along to ask questions. And I love patients who come well prepared with a two to three page questions and if they have more than that, I'd ask them to email me so I can look at it. <laughs> uh, plan ahead, if there are so many questions, email the doctor through the patient portals. Everything is available now, it's easy. And, and, and make sure that all the answers and the, all the questions are answered that you have. So how are you protected? We talked about the Institutional Review Board and the ethical guidelines. We talked about the informed consent. We talked about the IRB review. And there are a lot of information on the NIH website, on the FDA, Food and Drug Administration website, and the Office of Human Research Protection. So if you are very interested in this part of the process, which I am, there's a lot of data there. So once we complete the study, once the study is done, people who have participated in the trial here probably never know whether they got the real drug or the placebo, right? It always goes into this black box, which the researchers are trying to prevent. We would like to tell you that you got sildenafil or you got placebo. After the study is over, if it's a phase one or two trial, especially phase two trial, we start to say there is some hint that sildenafil works, improves your six minute walk test, improves your quality of life. Let's design a trial, a big trial, so we can get FD approval and provide this important drug to everybody who suffers from that. If it's a phase three trial completed, the researchers decide whether it's of medical importance. If the improvement that we are seeing with sildenafil Will it improve pulmonary hypertension? Will it improve quality of life? Will it improve patient survival? All those things are important as you start to dive into the data. And the study goes through a peer-reviewed process. So if I have done a study, Dr. First is looking at my, or Dr. Mays, says, well, Dinesh, this, this study, is it a good study? It's a bad study. What are the good parts of it? Is it clinically important? It's not clinically important. So it goes through this and it's published in a, in a journal. So let me walk you through how to search the web whether there are clinical trials or not. So clinicaltrials.gov has trials. All the trials that are done in US have to be registered at clinicaltrials.gov. So you are a person with scleroderma and you want to participate in a trial. You can go to clinicaltrials.gov, you can put scleroderma, and I put a trial with abatacept. Abatacept is a drug or orencia which is approved for rheumatoid arthritis, juvenile arthritis. 
it shows you that there have been two trials that have been done. The first one has been completed, and the second one is recruiting. Okay? So I'm just giving an example. If you just put scleroderma, there are about 80 to 90 trials that will come up. And then you click on, on the one that says recruiting, and it tells, starts telling you more about it. It says that I am the sponsor. So in other words, it's an investigator initiated trial. I thought about it. So I am taking the responsibility that the study will be done in an ethical manner. Who is funding the study? Bristol Myers Squibb and the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Disease. So NIH and Bristol Myers Squibb is doing the study. There's always a clinical trial number here, and then it will give you details about what we are actually doing. All this information is on the website. And all the participating centers where the studies are being doing should be available to everybody who is thinking about scleroderma and what they can participate. So let me talk about how do we design studies and what do we think about. I'm sure somebody during this meeting has talked about the natural history of scleroderma. Does everybody know where they are on this curve? Yes? So scleroderma, by definition, all of us don't have scleroderma till we have it. And the first symptoms usually are Raynaud phenomenon. This is not working. Uh, and the skin fibrosis or thickness starts to occur. And these are people who have diffuse scleroderma. So diffuse scleroderma, the skin fibrosis gets worse for about two to five years, and then it starts to soften. Many of you have gone through this. During this period, you get Raynaud's joint contractures, skeletal or muscle involvement, lung fibrosis, heart involvement, kidney crisis, and you may get pulmonary hypertension. If you have limited disease or Crest syndrome, you don't get a lot of skin thickening, but you get gut involvement, Raynaud's, lung fibrosis, pulmonary hypertension, malabsorption, primary biliary cirrhosis. So I want to design a study today in patients who have very early scleroderma, and I want to focus on the skin. Well, it's unlikely I will take people with limited scleroderma because the skin is not very involved. If I want to see an improvement in skin, I wouldn't be able to see that in this patient population. And for these studies, we capture something called modified Rodman skin score, the pinch test. All of you have gone through this, right? The pinch test where, where we pinch the skin and score it on normal, mild skin fibrosis, moderate skin fibrosis, severe skin fibrosis, and it's trying to measure the amount of collagen underneath your skin. And it's scored on a 0 to 51, and these are the different areas that we score. So let me give you an example of a phase two study with the drug from Roche Genentech that I led. This was a pharmaceutical industry funded study. And it's looking at a protein called interleukin-6. Anybody knows about this protein? No, okay, so we'll talk about interleukin-6 is a protein in human body that if we do skin biopsy, this is much more elevated than in people who do not have scleroderma. And patients who have diffuse scleroderma also have it in their blood, and so do people who have lung fibrosis. ILD is lung fibrosis. If you take a mouse, so I'm showing you the drug development, the thinking process. It's increased in people with early scleroderma. Now we go to mouse. When we take an antibody or a drug that blocks that interleukin-6, the fibrosis goes away. Okay, so the second step is mouse. The third is you start looking at all the people. You know, you come to Michigan, we collect blood, we collect skin biopsies, and you always think, what do we do with that? Well, there is this new protein we are interested. We can go to our database and say, well, we have all this blood stored. Let us look at this interleukin-6. And people found, Dr. Mays and others, that if you have IL-6, up front, when you come to University of Texas or Michigan, you're more likely to have more skin fibrosis and more likely to die due to scleroderma lung fibrosis, as an example. 
So this led to a design of a phase two study. So again, placebo controlled study. Double blind, people either got the tocilizumab injection or they got the placebo in injection. And we followed people for 48 weeks and we looked at the skin score. Now, we wanted, a people, we wanted people who have early disease. Remember the disease duration and the skin thickening? The skin gets worse early in the disease. It doesn't make sense to take somebody 15 years down the road. You want to capture people early on. So that's where the natural history becomes very important. They have elevated IL-6 because we know we are inhibiting that protein. So this is what the data showed. The data showed that in people who got the, the placebo, they really did not change over time. So, you know, almost a straight line, but people who got tocilizumab actually improved quite a bit. So I'm talking to you as a scientist how we did this study, how we are interpreting this study in our mind. So it shows a phase two study. So phase two study is trying to get a feel, does the drug work? It's not the final study that will lead to FDA approval. Very interesting, we had a molecule, it worked in mouse, this clear indication that if, you, if it's elevated, it causes more deaths and severe disease. Let's block it. The drug is already approved, by the way. The drug is called Ectemra. It's already approved for rheumatoid arthritis. Let's block it and see what happens. You block it and you show that people who participated in the diffuse, in the active treatment did much better. One of the very interesting factors here was that people who got the drug, the tocilizumab, so here are people who declined in their lung function. And people who got the placebo, 84% of the people had declined in their lung function versus 57% of the people who got the real drug. It may have beneficial effect actually on lung fibrosis. Now we would have never known this till you do a clinical trial, till you design an appropriate clinical trial to answer this question. Then as a scientist, we tend to dwell into it that why is the drug working? What is so important about this molecule, this protein, that's making me say that this may be important in scleroderma? So I'm just walking you through how this story evolved over the last two years or so. So we looked at something called macrophages. You don't need to know what macrophages are, but there are two kinds. M1 macrophage, if you are too inflamed, you get an infection, M1 goes up. If you get a lot of fibrosis, M2 goes up. And IL-6 plays a very important role in this, and by inhibiting this, yin-yang, we are trying to balance the imbalance that has happened. You look at skin fibrosis, all the skin biopsies we do, there's a lot of inflammation and a lot of IL-6 that's being produced out here. And then in the open label extension, so people till here got the double blind I showed you and then we gave everybody the drug. So now we have a trial design where we give placebo control. After a year, we give everybody the drug for another year. And see, the patients who got the placebo started to improve quite a bit, and at the end of two years, the placebo group and the real group caught up, so everybody improved. Now, on everybody, meaning on average, everybody improved, not each individual patient. I want to clarify that. Now, what is the other important thing that I have not shown you? Safe. Was the drug safe? I improved your lung function, I improved your skin fibrosis, but the other part of the question you have to ask, is the drug safe? So this is a medical slide and I will highlight a few things. How many serious adverse events happened? How many people got hospitalized? How many people died? How many things were serious things that we think are bad? So here it tells you, tocilizumab, 66 events for every 100 patients treated for a year versus 76 in placebo, no different. 
what does it highlight again? That scleroderma can be, and it can be a bad disease. You can see even in the placebo group who are getting, there are 76 serious adverse events happening every 100 patients treated for one year. But in the tocilizumab arm, there's no difference. But what you see here is the risk of infection is much higher with tocilizumab compared to the placebo. Okay? So the risk is about three times of serious infections. So these would be pneumonias, these would be bone infections, these would be things that would require IV antibiotic hospitalization. So you know now that it seems to be helping, but the risk of infection is important. So now, based on the data I showed you, we have moved into a phase three study, which is a pivotal trial, and the study got over. Some of you may have participated, and the data would be available in March or April of next drug. And if the study is positive, if the community says it's clinically meaningful, if all of us think the benefits outweigh the risk, if the Food and Drug Administration agrees with us, then that would be the first drug approved for management of scleroderma skin fibrosis in the U.S. So that's the whole story that has taken about 10 years of work, but how does everything? But none of them would be possible if people like you didn't participate in the study. It will still be in the mouse phase of the, of the study. I'm going to end my talk with the interstitial lung disease or lung fibrosis. How many of you have lung fibrosis here? So lung fibrosis or scarring of the lungs uh, is one of the leading causes apart from pulmonary arterial hypertension, cause of morbidity and death in scleroderma. So this is a study. So the question is who is doing it? Investigator initiated again. Who is funding it? NIH. 14 sites in U.S. where we looked at mycophenolate morphetal or CELSEP versus chemotherapy cyclophosphamide by mouth uh, for the management of scleroderma lung fibrosis. This was called scleroderma lung study 2. So we gave double-blind mycophenolate for two years or cytoxin for one year followed by matching pill for another year. Our thinking was that mycophenolate would be much better at the end of two years and would be much safer compared to the chemotherapy people or cyclophosphamide. So again, the amount of time and effort that goes into 198 people, a lot of people did not meet. We want to make sure what? That it's safe for you to do it. Some people had something else going on, the CAT scan, which is called HRCT had difficulty lung function, had other issues, so people are randomized, flip of a coin, almost half into cytoxin and half into mycophenolate, okay? So what did we start our thinking with? Our thinking is, you know, if you have two kids, you say both my kids are smart, and then one becomes a doctor, one's become something else. I'm not saying that doctors are smarter, just to clarify. <laughs> uh, what we found at the end of two years, after treating people with two years of mycophenolate and one year of cytoxin, that there was no difference at the end of two years in how much lung function improved. So we started with some idea, and our hypothesis was proven wrong. But again, this is not possible unless and until we select right people to do it. But the number of people who are clinically meaningful or a lot of improvement in their lung function was about 20% both in chemotherapy group and in the mycophenolate group. And the mycophenolate was better tolerated. So if you came to University of Michigan five years ago, everybody was started on cyclophosphamide. If you come to University of Michigan now, 90% of the people are started on mycophenolate. So this trial changed our treatment paradigm how to manage scleroderma lung fibrosis. Now the question should be why why is it available? Why it did not go through the Food and Drug Administration? Because the drug is already available. The drug is already generic. Uh, so there is no reason to go through the approval process, although some of you are denied mycophenolate because it is not FDA approved for the management of scleroderma. So I want to end my talk 
by making a pitch for scleroderma lung study three. So scleroderma lung study one, I didn't show you, showed that chemotherapy cytoxin is much better than a placebo pill, but much more toxic. Scleroderma lung study two showed that chemotherapy is as good as mycophenolate, but more toxic, so we started using mycophenolate. The third study is looking at whether we can give you perfenidone. Perfenidone is a drug that's approved for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. It's an antifibrotic therapy. What happens in scleroderma? There's a lot of fibrosis. We are using mycophenolate or Celsept as an immunosuppressive therapy and perfenidone as an antifibrotic therapy and to see if we combine both of them together, can we have a much higher beneficial effect compared to if we just gave you mycophenolate. And these are the centers, you know, there are two principal investigator centers, UCLA and, and Michigan, but here are the different centers and the study is about to be launched uh, within the next couple of months. So it talks about the advances we have made. Scleroderma lung fibrosis is one of the leading causes of death. We started with chemotherapy, we started to improve lives, but not so much quality of life. Mycophenolate is effective, but it's not a cure. Many of you who are taking mycophenolate would agree to that. Now we are seeing, can we add antifibrotic and change the, the paradigm and continue to make baby steps? Another part of the lung fibrosis is, if our phase two study with Ectemera is true, then we will be preventing lung fibrosis in the phase three study that we have completed and we will find out. The best thing is, can you prevent lung fibrosis? But if you can't, if you already have lung fibrosis, how do you manage it? And here is all the work that is going on. So you might think, why is this person giving a talk on clinical trials? So this is a snapshot. Scleroderma caused vascular abnormalities, Raynaud's digital ulcers. It caused inflammation and it caused fibrosis. Here are all the ongoing trials or trials that have ended and I'm not listing all of, all of them, but you can see how robust this field is. And my belief is we are on the verge of finding effective treatments, both for scleroderma, skin, lung fibrosis, and other, other complications. Thank you very much. Yes, um, I would like to know if there's a trial ongoing right now for the plasma phoresis, and if not, uh, when is, is there a plan for it? So the question is, is there a trial for plasma phoresis? I'm not aware of a trial of plasma phoresis. My understanding is that a few decades ago, there was a study done with plasma exchange or plasma phoresis that was not effective. Um, and again, the science develops and all of us have our own beliefs what works or not works. But I'm not aware of any trial that's being considered. So the recent one that um, is mentioned on the Scleroderma Foundation website where they're trying to recruit doctors and patients to um, uh, focus on that 22-year study that was done that was um, effective. You have no knowledge of that one? I don't. I do not have knowledge about that one. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? I was curious if you're worsening during a cl clinical trial, is that when you're unblinded and can switch over to non-placebo? So let's assume you are participating in a clinical trial and your lung fibrosis is worsening. Clearly, you're getting more short of breath. Uh, the lung functions are declining, then what happens? So usually you can continue either on the study medication and we can add another medication we deem is appropriate. So if you're on a placebo control study, we might add mycophenolate, choice A. Choice B, we take you out of the study. Remember, safety is paramount. We take you out of the study. We agree the drug is not working. We will switch you to mycophenolate. 
usually you are not switched to the investigational agent because we don't, we don't know whether it's effective. If you knew it was effective, then the rationale for clinical trial and placebo control goes down. Now, if you develop a bad infection during a clinical trial or a side effect that's very atypical and serious, then we have the authority as an investigator to unblind you and say, okay, whether you are getting the real drug or placebo, if it will change the management, how I treat you. If I'm planning to give you antibiotic irrespective, then we don't unblind. But if I think that by unblinding my treatment will be different, then we unblind you to find out what you are taking. Do all of these trials typically take 10 years? I mean, is there any way to speed this along? So not all the trials take 10 years. The ideas, you know, again, the safety and trying to look at the efficacy, no, they all don't take 10 years, but usually the, the finding of the molecule, its role in scleroderma, going through different series of finding that it's increased in scleroderma, whether it's increased because it's associated or whether it's part of the scleroderma causality, trying to test it and design a trial, trying to recruit 100 people with early diffuse scleroderma uh, does take some time. But having said that, the clinical trials and the participating participation from the community and the input from pharmaceutical company and NIH has been exceptional. As I showed you, if you go to scleroderma, sorry, clinicaltrials.gov, you will see about 80 trials that are going on around the globe and about 20 to 25, from pulmonary hypertension, digital ulcers, Raynaud's phenomenon, skin fibrosis, GI fibrosis. But I also want to highlight to you that your participation, your understanding is so critical to move this field forward. And I hope I was able to convey that participation is voluntary. There's a lot of safeguards that are built into a clinical trial. It's not that I had an idea uh, that, that smoking cannabinoid will be great for scleroderma, and then I open up a booth here and say, okay, let's see how you do. I hopefully, that will not go on YouTube. Okay, thank you, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. So what happens if the drug you're t receiving is only beneficial with ongoing use at the end of the study? That's an excellent question. So what happens if you took Ectemra and you're feeling better and now the study is ended? What, sh what are you supposed to do? It depends. So if it's a drug that's not FDA approved at all, then not much we can do. Uh, let me rephrase that. It depends on the phase of the study. If it's a phase one or two study, probably you can't continue. But if it's a phase three study and the data clearly shows that the drug was effective, we can work with the, the sponsor to provide you that. If the drug is already approved, such as Ectemra, we have been able to work with the insurance or the pharmaceutical companies to do that. In our Abatacept or Arencia trial, Bristol Myers Squibb is very dedicated and they said that if an investigator feels that the patient improved on the drug, we will provide the drug free to the patient for how many years they want it. But it all depends whether the drug is already available in the market or not. So the phase of the study and whether the drug is available in the market. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you.